Good evening, everyone. My name is Fritz Schroeder, and on behalf of the Lancaster Conservancy, welcome to Nature Hour. Lancaster Conservancy's mission is to provide wild and forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever. For 50 years, the Conservancy has sought out natural places that are so precious and beautiful, they must be protected. Our stewardship team manages these special places to both enhance habitat and build out trails for you and I to enjoy for hiking, hunting, fishing, and birding 365 days per year. Places like Shanks Ferry, House Rock, Kelly's Run, Otter Creek, Climber's Run, Welsh Mountain, and many others are protected forever under our management because of an incredible community network that includes elected officials, businesses, nonprofits, and patrons like you who support our work. We launched Nature Hour this past summer with the goal of bringing an assortment of local and regional experts directly to your home with presentations that help you better understand both the Conservancy's work and the work of our community partners. Tonight is the second of six Nature Hours taking place this winter and spring. Additional Nature Hours that have been announced include Regenerative Agriculture and Planetary Health with Rodale Institute on February 10th and Oysters in a Clear Bay with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation on February 24th. You can learn more and pre-register for these lectures on our website, lancasterconservancy.org under upcoming events. The Conservancy is blessed with incredible corporate support. And tonight we wanna to recognize our annual sponsors, Clark Associates, Electron Energy, Ritu Associates, Penstone and Nimblest. Thank you to these local companies for your commitment to supporting Lancaster Conservancy's work. Tonight, we are also very excited to welcome the Effort of Public Library as a co-presenter through a program called Resilient Communities, Libraries Responding to Climate Change with funding through the American Library Association. And now I'm going to turn the program over to our engagement coordinator, Keith Williams. Welcome, Keith. Thanks, Fritz. And uh, thank you all for joining us this evening for this really important conversation. And so you know, the mission of, of the Lancaster Conservancy of protecting land is critically important for a number of reasons, ranging from climate resilience and protection to biodiversity conservation to protecting our health, our human health through uh, you know, both physical, mental, and emotional health uh, with, with green spaces. Uh, equally important is engaging a really diverse community uh, in that work and in those open spaces. And, um, it's, and that's, it's important for a number of reasons ranging from the practical that if we don't engage a really wide base, a really wide community, we don't have the support that we need to accomplish this, this work uh, to, um, you know, the bottom line is it's just the right thing to do. Um, it's been my pleasure to work with Felipe Benitez for I think the last five or six years in, in uh, you know, engaging uh, diverse communities in outdoor and environmental education. And uh, Felipe is the principal of Benitez Strategies and a founder and executive director of Corus Latino, which is a fabulous nonprofit um, doing work in, in 20 different states, 20 plus states. He's got more than 15 years of experience engaging and empowering Latino communities in conservation, environmental justice, civic engagement, and economic justice issues. He's worked on a vast range of campaigns from protecting the Amazon rainforest to protecting rights of immigrants and refugees in the United States. Most recently, he's been heavily involved in, in climate campaigns. In fact, he was just in the New York Times. He was on Telemundo. I, I lost count, Felipe, three or four times this week, I think I, I saw you on Telemundo. Um, so we are really honored that Felipe made time to join us here today. Uh, through his work at Corazon Latino, he's led the implementation of culturally relevant and linguistically appropriate conservation initiatives all over the place. Please welcome me, uh, Felipe Benitez. Thank you very much, Keith, uh, Kelly, Fritz. This is a, a, a very, I'm very, very honored to be here, very humbled to be joining you this afternoon. And gosh, you guys were impeccable with your timing. Uh, the day that we have this major uh, advancement uh, and these executive orders from the Biden administration, the, the Biden-Harris administration, I wanna call it as it is. Um, it was a, a very exciting days. And, and I mean, we're just digesting what came uh, uh, out of, of the White House today, but there was some exciting news, obviously on the both fronts, on the uh, domestic, international, and we see a lot about uh, our public lands, which makes fills my, my heart with joy. So, so yeah, well done, Kelly. Well done, Keith. Well done, Fritz. We we, we got it right. We you, I know you got the insider information probably three months in advance or four probably when we started doing this. Anywho, uh, I'm uh, I'm very very uh, humble, very honored to be here. Uh, I'm right now. I'm 
most of, of, of my time I spent it in Washington, D.C., uh, but since COVID, uh, I moved uh, and with my family to West Virginia. So I'm, I want to acknowledge that right now I'm in the sacred lands of the Saponi and Delaware uh, tribes. Um, so it is, we're um, really honoring and, 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 and asking for, for their spiritual support and, and, and guidance for this in this journey in the next hour. So let's get started uh, and feel free as, as Kelly mentioned, if you have any questions, comments, I would love to hear where you guys from, if you have any specific questions, if, some, if there's any, any, um, any comment or any, anything that pops up during my presentation, feel free. I, I tend to be able to multitask and if not, Keith will can let me know and we'll have a Q and A session, but uh, it's always nice and I wanna keep it as informal as possible. So let me get started. So, okay, so we went through all this and they told me what to do the share screen. So hopefully we'll get it right. Okay, continue. So bear with me, please. Um, all right. I'm assuming everybody can see uh, a slide right now. Um, Keith or Kelly, just let me know. Yes, great, thank you. Cause now I don't have visibility on the chat box. All righty, so let's get started. So Corazón Latino, um, our mission is, uh, as Keith was um, mentioning in the, in the kind introduction, our mission is to reconnect. And, and, and please know that I'm using the word reconnect Latino and communities of colors with nature. And why do I say reconnect? Because first of all, as human beings, as, 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 um, as part of the human race, we, are, we all have a connection with nature. But sometimes we forget about it. Sometimes uh, technology, sometimes living in cities, sometimes uh, our own uh, bubble in COVID makes us forget that nature is there for us. So our mission is really to find those experiences and especially with Latino communities where um, I wanna say that uh, conservation connections with nature are part of our DNA. It is embedded as part of the way we are raised. So especially with immigrant communities with, uh, 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 or, or recent immigrants or first, second generation uh, Latinos, we, we like to bring those opportunities and we just like to like remind them what it is to connect and, and all the benefits and all of the joys that nature brings us. And we do this in a culturally, what we call it in a culturally relevant and linguistically appropriate appropriate way. And I'll explain a little bit what that means, but it's just our fancy fancy term to say that we actually do stuff that connects with our target audience, with Latinos and communities of color. We have uh, programs um, uh, that are um, in this four, five buckets. Um, we believe the correlation between health, human health and forest health, uh, if trees are, are, are healthy, very likely the community uh, that surrounds it will be healthy. So there's that interconnection. The Scuba del Bosque, which is an online platform that we run on behalf of the Forest Service and the Ad Council, where we provide uh, through social media messaging uh, related to nature, how families can connect with nature. Citizen science, and we'll talk a little bit about this particular, but we've been doing a lot of amazing uh, and very exciting work in the, in the, um, um, DC area, Maryland, Virginia, but also in Puerto Rico. We also, because of our work in Puerto Rico, and now uh, connect a little bit of our Chesapeake Bay work, which I, I can tell you a little bit. Uh, we, we are also very engaged in, cons in ocean conservation. And then one generic place that we are, we call it the strategic communications for the common good. I come from a, a um, strategic communications, a public relations, public affairs background. So for me, using the power and the tools that communications and media, social media, and even um, peer to peer uh, um, uh, communications are, are essential for our work. So, so this is uh, generically how we do. We have, we're very blessed that in three years we've accomplished a lot. And this is our footprint. We have um, almost 20 states plus Puerto Rico and Hawaii. In some places we have full-time staff like in Arizona, New Mexico, um, uh, in Illinois, in the DC area, and West Virginia, and in Puerto Rico, and in other states, we have uh, allies or what we call ambassadors. 
So in any given day for any, any opportunity, we're able to tap into our network. And let's say for Earth, Day, we'll be likely having events in all of these places, or at least in the majority. Internationally, we also have staff in Mexico, in Panama, and in Chile. So we're proud, we're, we're looking into expanding a few other uh, countries like Costa Rica. And what we do is um, we create uh, programs, we create methodologies that are replicable and that are scalable. It's not like, oh, this is the, we, we just keep it to ourselves. No, we want folks to use it, to follow uh, our, our um, we create toolkits, we create ideas, and we really put it out. And if anybody wants to take ownership and do it, go ahead. And it'll, it'll make a little bit of more sense when, when, when we get into the programming. We have uh, fantastic partners um, so throughout these three years from the um, uh, agencies that manage our public lands, like the Forest Service, National Park Service, to large uh, uh, nonprofits like Nature Conservancy, American Forest. Uh, I mean, we are very blessed to have uh, the trust and have the opportunity to really support the outreach of organizations, big and small, uh, all kinds. We are open to really creating partnerships. We believe that there's no one organization that can solve all the Latino, all, all the people of color uh, problems or, or access to nature. We believe in collective impact. So we are always happy where we take the call with whoever wants to, 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 to chat. And I encourage you right now, if you have any questions or any comments or any specific challenges in the next couple of weeks, months, and you want to just use this, uh, the second part of our, of our presentation to address them, I'm very happy to, to support you. And if not, I'll, I'll leave my email and, and we'll be able to, to catch up and, and figure out how can we collaborate. Um, we've been uh, recognized by, by, by uh, already in, in the three years by, by, by some awards because of our, our, our work, like the Shift Awards in, out of Wyoming and the Chiefs Award from uh, the USDA Forest Service. Um, and this is how, how we do the, this work. We, we create a, a model of engagement that this is, one, those of you who have done community organizing will recognize it, is really how do we reach a community, in this case, the Latinx, Latino, Hispanic, however you want to call it, is we do it, uh, we, we want to create a surround sound or like a, a Dolby sound, like you're in a, in a movie theater around our, the communities we're re reaching. And we do that through digital strategies. I mentioned that we, we are very keen and we are very, uh, uh, we believe in social media being a, a very important tool. Traditional media, as Keith was mentioning, there's still, uh, uh, it's still a, a very effective way to reach our, our audiences and Telemundo, Univision, the local newspaper or the rock, local radio station are very important um, messengers for our, our work. And we also know that all of these media outlets, whether it's a national or a, or a, or a small uh, mom and pop uh, radio station, they are always looking for information for uh, topics on environmental and conservation issues. Yes, it was very, very funny. I, I ended up doing a, um, an interview for a, an outlet in in Georgia and I, I thought in Atlanta and I thought it was going to be just like a 10 minute uh, uh, conversation about the Biden uh, uh, climate work and what was coming and then end up being a whole hour in on on radio talking about Biden about uh, climate about our public lands about Corazon Latino so it just tells you that there's a huge appetite for uh, the topics that we we talk about because it's sometimes a a, a, a a breath of fresh air within all the news that we hear, immigration, economics, COVID. Well, let's talk about bats. Let's talk about uh, trees. Let's talk about our national, uh, of our green spaces. It's always a good, so, so we use that. And obviously grassroots activities and it's really doing on the ground um, uh, events. And we use this model and we touch on different, um, different type of, of issues like, uh, urban forestry, conservation, education, recreation, even civic engagement. We actually mobilized our network in this past November for uh, encourage Latinos, Latino voters in Arizona, Florida, Michigan, um, Pennsylvania, and I'm forgetting what other state and Puerto Rico uh, to to vote to 
exercise their right to vote on a nonpartisan way, uh, but encourage them to vote for our madre tierra, for the environment, for clean air, for clean water for our kids. So we we use this model in 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 our in our work. Our impact in a non-COVID year, we 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 are, have an average 200 events per year. We on average uh, reach 40,000 members of the public. Uh, COVID gave us an opportunity to uh, up our online engagement. Right now we have, uh, within Latin organizations around the nation, we have uh, Latino environmental organizations. We have the largest following on social media. We reach almost 100,000 followers. And we have done a lot of experimentation like this one. Like we do panels, we do music, we do concerts and uh, all, all connected to nature. Uh, very early on the pandemic, we had um, medical experts and epidemiologists talking about COVID. And that has allowed us to keep our, uh, our, 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 um, our, um, uh, our target audience or, or our population or our followers engaged. We also uh, were asked by the USDA, the, the Department of Agriculture to support uh, the food um, distribution, the farmers to, to families food distribution. And we were able to mobilize our partners in Arizona, uh, California, and in Puerto Rico and deliver more than 100,000 food boxes in uh, the better half of, of last year. So we're very proud of that. We, we raise up to the occasion and say, we, we cannot in all good conscience ask people to take care of, of a park or join uh, or enjoy nature if, they are, if they're hungry, if their families are, are, are struggling for food. So, but we, once we do this, like, okay, let's talk about <laughs> environmental issues. Let's talk about nutrition. Um, we have, uh, as I mentioned, we, we were able to, to engage more than 130,000 Latino voters uh, for the past, this past election. And we are very proud to have three Corazón Latino schools, one in, in DC, one in Utah, and one in Puerto Rico. And what does that mean? We have uh, signed uh, agreements, uh, collaboration agreements with them, and we help them through the US Forest Service and our other partners to provide conservation education and environmental education within their either uh, outside, um, either in their in the regular curriculum or as external activities. So we, we actually in DC, we created a very nice, very pretty uh, pollinator garden in, in, in Mundo Verde, which is my son's uh, school. We believe uh, that there's a reciprocity between a, re a reciprocity relationship uh, between humans and nature. If we take care of nature, nature is gonna take care of, of us. And we believe that immensely. If we plant a tree, if we spend time uh, cleaning uh, a, a, a green area, if we do um, um, removal of, of invasive species, if we are connecting with nature, our body, our um, uh, we receive those benefits and you know all the science behind it, like spending even 20 minutes in nature or the fit and size that trees provide doing citizen science, we are receiving those benefits. So the more we care for nature, nature will care for us. And that's something that we uh, instill in, in all our events and in all our, 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 our communication because uh, that helps us because once folks, once our target audiences, once our, our communities, our families that we work with understand this relationship, they would be more keen to, to, to take, the, take the next steps. We know that planting a tree can lead into civic engagement in a very direct way. And there's research that shows that. So we truly believe in this. And obviously here, it's, a, it's a, one of our fancy projects. Uh, and uh, this is actually in the Junque National Forest. Um, we were blessed to be brought to create the first citizen science uh, project in El Junque, not in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico has been has had many citizen science uh, initiatives, but this particular one was in El Junque. So after Hurricane Maria, uh, you probably saw the, the images that it was like the, the El Junque was completely like burned down. Like it was like there was nothing. Two years later, El Junque is back. El Junque is green and it's beautiful, uh, and it's and it's and it's uh, re recovering from 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 that. I mean, at the end of the day, El Junque was created through the through hurricanes and it's part of of, of of its natural cycle. 
But uh, as uh, the, the Forest Service who manages the land uh, uh, obviously doesn't know, doesn't have enough information of what grew up back there, uh, what, what is the, new, the composition of El Junque, so, um, of the new composition. So they had a scientific question, but they also, as part of their, uh, of their management process, they heard from the community that the community surrounding El Junque wanted access to El Junque. And that doesn't mean we, we want more roads or we want more entrances. We want to be part of the management of caring for our, our natural treasure. And so a, a very bright woman, a uh, young lady, um, uh, came with the idea, let's do a citizen science project. Let's bring the community, let's train the community to help us collect the scientific data that we need. And that was a project that uh, was implemented in, in 2019. It lasted a year and a half. It was, it was amazing. We, we, we brought, um, I, I can't remember, but it was probably 150 volunteers because they had to go through a strict process of training just to make sure that, I mean, because it's, it's really in the jungle. I mean, in the rainforest, it's not like in the, in the tourist area, like you're getting into very complex and, 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 uh, and Keith was there and, and, and it, it is challenging, but also we wanna make sure that we, we, we take them and do um, uh, the, the scientific, uh, that collect the information that, that will serve or will be used by, by, by uh, land managers there. So, so we come up from the uh, point of view that translations are not enough. And those, for those who speak Spanish or English, um, spend a little bit of English or, or can, or uh, not English, Spanish, I'm sorry. Uh, you will see that, um, that these are really bad translations. So using Google Doc or Google Translate, uh, it's not a, a strategy for, for, um, for uh, an engagement with Latino communities. So, Extreme caution, watch for eyes. It was more or less uh, through a Google Translate. It was translated as the clock extreme, be careful for the eyes. So it makes no sense in Spanish, but people think like, oh, we put out information in Spanish. And this is something that, I mean, this goes to the extreme, but this is something that we've seen a lot that people, organizations, well-intentioned, they will try to say like, oh, let's put a flyer in Spanish or hey, let's bring the, the the, the intern who happens to be, whose last name is Benitez, they, they, they can take care of our, our they, they will bring Latinos into our, into our public land or to our programming. And so they, they show, they, Latinos don't show up or maybe they're showing up, but in different times. And so therefore, yeah, you know, we try, they don't care. So it is important to, to really think about the culturally and linguistic relevancy. So just on a, on a quick, um, quick uh, uh, terminology, I'm, I just wanna give you, it's, uh, open to discussion, uh, but different ways of, of referring to Latino community. Latino, Hispanic, Latino is more common. Hispanic is a, it's used for the federal government and Latinx, it's a term to, um, that it's more, uh, that's been um, mostly adopted by, by younger millennial generations in which really um, trying to do an, a gender neutral term, which I mean, whatever you like, it's appropriate. It will be very uh, useful to use it depending on your target audience, but they are all okay. So just be consistent. Make sure that if you choose one of these three, just be consistent on, on, the, on the terms you use. So on one of the, 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 the challenges of Latino communities that as we, we know, and we saw it during, during the, this past election, that the Latino community is not a monolith. There's different, uh, and I can explain this. So um, let me see, I want to do a quick poll with the participants. For those who are speak Spanish or have um, spent time in Latin America or with, your, or, or with Latino communities, we know that the, the, the picture on the left, it's a cake. So how would you call it? And I cannot see the responses, but if you don't mind just putting in, your, in the chat box, uh, how do you call it? Uh, and Keith or or Kelly, would you mind just reading some of the the the, the responses? It's ape a pastel, via bizcocho, si a torta, or any other. So let's give a, a minute or two to, to folks to respond. I'll kind of read them as they come in here. Um, we've got oh wow, we've got a lot of a a b or c c c c. <laughs> C A C A or C depending where you are, and then C again. That's great. So the, those three terms are correct. It's there's a it in 
in Mexico, you call it a pastel. In Puerto Rico, you can call it a bizcocho. And in South America, you can call it a torta. So a simple term. However, I'm from Mexico. And if I go in Puebla, where I'm from, and I ask for a torta, oops, this is what I'm going to get. Uh, so it's sandwich, which which is good, but um, I could be, it could be, it could pose a challenge. So this is it just exemplifies that uh, there's not a cookie cutter approach. You have to understand your community. You have to understand uh, what are the, the 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 nationalities? What is their type? Like if you're talking to uh, to uh, Central Americans in in DC or Puerto Ricans in in New England, so. Uh, or, or or Dominicans in, in in New York, so you just need to understand who you are because a word can make a difference, can make it or break it. So uh, again, I'm not trying to scare you, but this is important concepts that we need to to really uh, embrace. And and again, just having somebody from that speaks Spanish does not guarantee you that it's going to be relevant uh, culturally and and linguistically. Uh, so just just uh, in in terms of, the, of of nationalities, we have different countries plus Puerto Rico, and if you want to go even more, Spain could be considered Hispanic or Latino. So you get a variety. There's common ground. Don't don't get me wrong. There's uh, ways of uh, of talking. I think there's the Royal Academy of the of the the um, La Real Academia de la Lengua, where there's the the, the, the specific um, uh, approved language, and I mean there's ways, but just know that it's not going to be a cookie cutter or a simple Google Translate solution. Um, another important issue that, that I want to, to, to raise is, um, and, and there, a lot of the common ground that we found is that how we enjoy nature. And I, I, I like to, to bring those, these, two, these two pictures because I cannot tell the uh, two, two uh, 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 diameter or two very, very, uh, different ways of enjoying nature. On the, on the left side, it's very solitude with your puppy, uh, probably taking a couple of thousand dollars of worth of equipment. Um, and on the right, it's a party. Uh, it is a, a, it's loud, it's food. What we want to tell you is there's not a wrong or right way of connecting with nature. They're just different ways. And they are both equally important, equally uh, um, fulfilling, and they serve its purpose. So what I, what I want to say is like trying to fit one into the other, it's a mistake. And we sometimes try to do that. Or not being open to the other, it's, it's, it's where you can get challenges. And we see this in practice. Uh, for example, um, on any public line on a Sunday morning, you will get the hikers, the, the individuals that are but if you go after church at 2 or 3 p.m. in the afternoon, you're going to probably see what on the picture on the right. And again, it's the same way. And you should not expect communities to fill or to, to fit a mold in terms of, of, of how you want, of how they, they need to do. They're going to be loud. They're going to be, uh, uh, um, uh, they're going to, be, they're going to have food. They're going to have a, a different way of enjoyment. This is very important. This is something that we really uh, try to, 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 to emphasize with our partners, because it, it, because a lack of understanding of, of these different ways of, of connecting with nature, it's um it, it creates issues. Uh, so for example, if you have a family, a Latino family, or an or a or a, a, a community of color that wants to do camping, well, it's not just that they're gonna be mom, pop, the three kids. No, they're gonna go gonna bring the primos, the tias, the abuelitos, and and. A campsite that may be designed for five, seven people, it might have to fit 10 or 15. And then uh, the park ranger, the forest ranger will be like, hey, this is not how it is. And then it creates a negative experience. So we just need to be aware of these differences. Uh, again, uh, for example, um, another practical term, we, 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 when we were creating uh, and, and starting testing on, on our events with Corazón Latino, we, we tested on, on Saturday mornings. Like let's do it at 8 a.m. on a Saturday morning, which is, I mean, common, a common time. And a lot of organizations do events at that. And suddenly, well, we've got no, no Latinos. Well, at least in the DC era where we started, we knew we, we weren't considering that Latinos are usually working on Saturdays. They're still, I mean, if they're in the, in the 
food industry or hospitality industry, they still work on Saturdays. So when do we want to do it? We want to do it on Sundays. But we don't want to do it before noon because guess what? At noon, we go to church. So we don't want to compete with God. So our events need to happen in the afternoon. So just that specific change of like, let's do events in the afternoon after 12 p.m., suddenly we start getting and seeing our numbers increase and we started getting repeat. But that comes also with challenges because if they're coming after church, it will they will come, our families, the families that we serve, they will come dress in church clothes. They will bring, as, as I mentioned, the abuelito, the abuelita, the tío, everybody will be. So we wanna make sure that whatever experience we create, uh, it uh, accommodates every age. So it could be a toddler or it could be a, 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 an older adult. We wanna make sure that they don't feel excluded. We need to make sure that we're creating, that we bring the proper equipment, that we are ready to provide them with what they need to have a memorable experience. So those are the, the what I invite you to think when you're designing and when you're uh, trying to engage these Latino communities, what are the, what times do they go? Sometimes in certain public lands uh, I've seen, for example, and, and keep my, my remember, we were doing a scoping in the Shenandoah Val, uh, River and suddenly we were, we, it was a Tuesday, so Tuesday or Wednesday or some during the week. And guess what? We were, we were in the river um, and, and suddenly we start hearing this loud music and we suddenly encounter three families that on their day off or their week off, they have traveled all the way from, from New York and they knew this particular space and they were just camping, having a lot of phone floating. But again, on a Tuesday, we will never, uh, on, on in the middle of, I, I can't remember, probably in, the, in early summer, we will not expect to see that. So they're probably already in your public lands. They might not be following this, the regular part patterns, but they're there. So you need to be mindful of all those differences and when are they there? How are they enjoying it? What kind of activities did they, did they do? We, we uh, another organization that we help is the, the Chesapeake Bay National, Nat uh, uh, National Park Service. And we were just chatting with some of their, their park rangers and it's, they, they call it almost like a, it's like we, we the way that, that certain parks or certain public spaces or green spaces are enjoyed, it's almost like shifts. So then six to 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 9 a.m. It's probably the, the super um, high intensity uh, folks that enjoy nature. Then from nine to 12, you have the families, but then they leave. Uh, and then later in the afternoon, it's the Latinos. And it's always interesting because again, we do it in different times with different in, in different activities. So we just need to be mindful of, of those elements. Uh, so a couple of recommendations. Are, are we okay, Kelly, uh, Keith, any questions, any comments that, that we may be addressing or something that I may have said that makes no sense? I think we're good, Felipe. There's a couple of questions in the queue, but I think we can hold them to the end. So I think just uh, keep on going. Great. So a couple of recommendations. And now that I have you on, on screen, because I, I don't want you now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call on you. So <laughs> uh, one of the 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 the, uh, the elements that we that we have to start figuring out on how to bring Latinos into and in, into the into our programming was what were those barriers of entry? What are those elements that are preventing families to 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 enjoy nature or to spend a weekend? camping or to even just go on a Sunday afternoon to their local park. So we started seeing cost, maybe if, if does, a, does a public land uh, needs, uh, has an entry fee? Uh, is there, if, 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 is it located in a, in a way that it's not accessible through public transportation? Um, once they're there, what other uh, costs are they incurring? So transportation and entry fees. Uh, knowledge. Do they know that this park is there or this public land is there for them? Do they know that maybe it's free? Maybe uh, if they have a four-year-old, they may get uh, a fourth grader. Sorry, they may get a a, um, a pass from the the every kid in a park or every kid outdoors park um, pass, or maybe there is uh, that it's free or open to the public on on certain days. So lack of information uh, and also distrust. I mean, at the end of the day. Uh, we, the reality is that for communities of color, distrust in uniforms is real. And it could be immigration, could be law enforcement, name, 
name it what it is. So and and bad experiences to be to be often and uh, to be to be to be uh, fair and to be um, open about this. I mean, racism uh, or or just getting the bad looks or or, or having a, a a bad interaction that brings. So what we try to do is just try to bring those barriers of entry down. So let's say if we are doing something in a, in a place that it's not with not uh, that there's no easy public uh, transportation. Well, what can we do to motivate? So can we provide a stipend for them to go? Can we rent a bus to 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 bring the families to, to the place? Or uh, we're very mindful, like because um, and and Keith will will um will can can attest to that sometimes if it's an activity or like we we. We'll show you a, a specific one where there was a river-based programming. If we are charging them, even if it's a minimum amount, like oh, it's a five dollar and it will get you access to this. Well, you have a family of four or five, five dollar a piece, and you're making minimum wage. It's it's a deal breaker, or sometimes just uh, just basic information. So having information in Spanish, having somebody to call and say, hey, we're interested in going. What do we need to bring? Uh, is it safe? Can I bring my my three year old? Can I bring my uh, my grandmother? All of those elements. So, what are those elements uh, of entry? So, this example that I'm showing, it's kind of the extreme. We were able to bring, and uh, we were very blessed with funding from the Forest Service to bring. I think that first time it was around 40 people, Keith. Yeah. Yeah, and then the second one we did more. We looked like 80 people, 80 uh, families, families that we knew that we were. Um, uh, working with in, in several events in the in the Maryland area, and uh, we we got a uh, in in the North Bay uh, camps uh, center which Keith um, um, ran, and we said okay let's bring these families. Um, it is a, a a ride from 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 Washington from Maryland. It's at least ninety minutes, and on a Friday with traffic's probably two hours. Uh, so we, they took a leap of faith. We invited them. We show them this is for free. This is for you guys, but you're not going to just go and, and relax. You're going to work. We're gonna, you're going to learn. We're going to put you to, to do, to, to do activities. And, 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 and again, we offer them, uh, a buzz. We, they didn't have to pay anything for, for their lodging. Uh, and, and it was it, it was it was an amazing experience. But once we, they were there, it, it was a very funny. But it's kind of uh, um, tells you all that we were when on the way there to the to the to the to the campsite. Somebody asked one of our our of our staff members of Corazon Latino, like, "Yeah, tell me the truth. Are you guys gonna harvest my organs after this? I'm fine with that because there's this trust. So like, there's not nothing free. But but then build that trust and build that uh, that uh, that um feel them welcome. So I don't know, Keith, you want to comment any of those? Uh, yeah, this was, and so I'm, I'm kind of coming at this from uh, from an uh, outdoor and environmental education practitioner perspective. And, you know, from, from our perspective, it was really important to engage underrepresented uh, communities. And so the partnership with Cars and Latino was a no brainer. But this was was the middle part of a three part effort to uh, engage uh, Latino families in citizen science. And so they started doing some citizen science investigations near their homes. And then we brought them to North Bay, which is a very plush um, uh, place to do outdoor education. It's, you know, carpeted, air conditioned. So uh, it was away from home, which addressed that fear factor that Felipe is talking about, right? Uh, but it's a really safe place for people that might not be used to being outside to, to have that first experience. And then the third experience was out in a national forest that was much more of a wilderness experience. And so kind of that stepwise progression that, that Felipe yep. they laid out. Um, to work to overcome that fear factor was critically important. In addition to, you know, addressing those other roadblocks like transportation, like funding, um, and it was a highly successful uh, event. Um, you know, we had at the end of the first weekend, I had uh, three guys come up to me and ask if they could help do landscaping as a way to, to give back, uh, as a way of thanking us for, for the experience, and that said volumes. And, and you can see obviously having Keith uh, uh, support and, and his his the, the staff at the time, but we also brought folks that look like uh, like the community that are part of the community and will understand and will 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 help provide very basic information because uh, safety issues, uh, even just general etiquette or 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 or, or um, 
uh, land ethics, we, we sometimes we need to reinforce them. So just try it, but in a very positive. So I remember that on those two, uh, in those two uh, events or those two weekends, we actually ended up uh, talking to them about, I think, 15 different topics, anywhere from forest fire prevention to citizen science to uh, water uh, water pollution. I mean, we, we all the way to to the to historic with that. We had um, what was the name of the, of this um, uh, the um, the Buffalo Soldiers? The Buffalo Soldiers came and and, and they gave a, and presentation so so we we in two days we packed them with a lot of information and and it was as as you said it was it was a very successful so as i was telling be ready i mean don't expect that our, your these communities our communities will bring and know or have the equipment so this was sort of the one of those steps that keith mentioned there was a we we partnered with other organizations to a river based event and uh, again, the, the, the image on the left tell, spoke, speaks volumes. They, they were brought, they brought the baby, they brought the, the grandparents and they were, they brought their Sunday or their weekend clothes or, or they didn't bring special equipment. So we had to provide them with that. And we have to make sure that they had uh, dry clothes and that they felt comfortable because a bad experience here will probably be counterproductive for, for, the, for the future of, of, of their uh, um, experiences. So, so for that, we were very thoughtful on what do we need to do, what kind of, of equipment do we need to, to bring, what kind of education, what kind of food do we want to, to make available for them, um, that it's uh, something that it's that is easy to, and that it makes them, we, we always bring a couple of elements that we always bring into our events, it's music, dance, and food, because those brings any any community, bring, those three elements brings any community together, but breaking the ice with the Zumba class or, or with uh, um, uh, 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 some dancing and then uh, music throughout the, the, the time, it makes the, 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 the experience much more accessible. And then at the end of the day, uh, food that really brings the whole, and, and again, we're teaching them, we're, we're providing them with, with education, we're asking them to do something, but in a way that it's fun. So a funder once told me, like, you guys are asking me to, for money to, to throw parties at, at the park, right? Like, yeah, pretty much. I so like, I love it because that's how we bring our communities. So, so yeah, that's basically what we did. And 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 and, and just another comment. Um, and because I know we, we're we're on time, and I want to leave some op some opportunity for question and answer. It is not try to avoid a moment. Uh, uh, if you're starting to outreach to communities of color. Um, to be a, a transactional, like, oh, come here and, and we'll do, do this for our funding or for this particular grant or because we our board is asking us to be more diverse. Uh, don't take it as a transaction, especially if you're partnering with, our, with, with, with uh, organizations that are serving these communities. Make sure that you're there in every month. And this is uh, an example that I, that I wanted to bring. And, and on the left, you'll see the, the work that we did in Puerto Rico and we, we ended up distributing almost 100,000 boxes. The, the one on the right was uh, uh, somewhere we did in Michigan and the, we, we were doing a, 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 a ceremonial tree planting and the, the, the young lady that is leading the, the event, it's, it's Brianna Taylor's um, uh, aunt. So we're there and we bring nature, we bring joy in moments that are challenging, especially right now during COVID times and we don't know how things, I mean, we're, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and poor Keith just got his second uh, vaccine and he's a little bit loopy, but we're getting there. <laughs> However, we, we still don't know what the new normal is going to be. And now more than ever, people, humans, we all need nature and we need to, 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 to do it in a, in a way that it's safe, that it's nourishing, but at the same time that keeps that connection going. So that, that's just a, a final thought that I had. Uh, Keith, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to this. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's excellent, Philippe. And I think you make a lot of excellent points uh, that are very practical takeaways uh, that we'll get to here in a minute. Uh, but I wanted to address a couple of the questions that came up during your presentation. Absolutely. So, this one is a huge one, uh, but I, I know you're going to feel this perfectly fine. Do you think that the rights of nature are instrumentalized by Latin American countries to reinforce their sovereignty over natural resources and or against IMF and World Bank domination? Well, at the end of the day, uh, we know how to, Latin Americans know how to care for nature. Latin Americans 
know how to uh, live with nature and have that reci reciprocity uh, um, um, relationship. So yeah, sometimes nature and natural resources can be used as a tool for domination, but at the same time, we are uh, in the possibility of really showing and leading the world in issues like climate change, in issues like uh, uh, in health, in a lot of in 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 things that are affecting our community, and I think people are starting to pay attention, starting to pay attention that today on on Biden's uh, uh, executive orders there was uh, obviously the the thirty percent uh, the thirty by thirty thirty percent of the of, of reaching our goals to tackle climate change comes from nature and guess who knows how to take care of nature and how to make it sustainable? Latin Americans, indigenous, no, and obviously indigenous groups around the world. So yes, it has been a tool, but at the same time, the world is realizing, I think I do believe this, there's a shift in conscious right now happening that Madre Tierra, our mother earth is what uh, is gonna make, is what will make, or honoring our Madre Tierra our land is gonna make our uh, survive as a human species, even if it's slow, even if 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 if, if the powers that be are st slowly doing it. But I think slowly we're getting there. So I don't know if that answered, but it's just what I wanted to to respond. Uh, we are the keepers. We are those who understand and know how to do. I, I remember a project that I was doing uh, a couple of years ago with Ecuador with the Yasuni Initiative, and a Harvard professor, which I uh, I can't remember his name right now, but uh, we were. This is a particular piece of land that it's in the Amazonian, that has the big, the largest biodiversity in the world, and it's a couple of hectares that have more biodiversity than the whole North American uh, subcontinent. And he basically said the Yasuni is a book of wisdom that we have not yet opened. Solutions to health. Uh, a lot of, of can be found in, in the Yasuni. So we need to, that's what we need to protect it. But guess what, under the Yasuni, it's also a lot, one of the largest uh, um, reserves of oil in, for Ecuador. And it, Ecuador, it's a country that needs oil uh, to, to, to survive. So we were trying to figure out how to bring uh, economic uh, or, or, or contributions from the world to not have them not do that didn't work as well as we wanted but at least that was an important so anyhow that was my point i don't know if i, I answered but i wanted to at least is what i wanted to to say yeah great thanks felipe um do you work on any specific projects elsewhere in the spanish-speaking world I, what was the question again sorry do you work on any specific projects elsewhere in the spanish-speaking world i know you've got a lot of work going on in puerto rico you were talking about some work in yes Chile. we so this model, uh, especially, it's, it's actually very innovative, uh, like bringing uh, citizen science, bringing forest therapy, bringing water-based activities. Uh, we try to create almost events in a box. So if it's Earth Day or if it's National Public Lands Day, we try to bring those elements of technology and and and, and what I mentioned. Uh, we we would have a almost like a like a uh, like a franchise. We have this is how the event goes. We set up at this time, so we have everything documented. We have a planning planning documents that then can be shared and can be used by anybody who wants to do it. We have the messaging. We know how, how to do it. So, with that, we are able to bring this to other countries. So, uh, again, in Mexico, we have a, a, some of our staff works there. So, so we've been doing work there. Citizen Science in Puerto Rico. We are part of City Nature Challenge, uh, and we have we do. Um, uh, activations on, 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 on citizen science, beach cleanups. In Chile, we've done uh, also forest therapy. Uh, so this is a model that works. It's a model that, that can be tailored, needs to be tailored to the local community, but, uh, but it's very open. And, and folks we've learned, and even in Panama right now, uh, the, the government uh, and the natural resources ministry is really interested in creating a partnership with us to, to bring this at scale in Panama. Excellent. Yeah, I thought it was really genius in uh, at El Junque in Puerto Rico, the way you address two needs that seem to be divergent, right? You had the need for scientific data uh, to help manage the forest, 
And then you had the need of local communities that for a long time were not included in any of the planning going on with El Junque. That land was taken from, from their families you know, decades ago, and then they were excluded from that. And you were able to bring those two groups together uh, using citizen science as that tool. I think that's really uh, a, an excellent model that, that could be replicated elsewhere. Um, yes, one of the elements that we brought there, just Keith, is bringing the the scientists, bringing those who are who who are doing the the work and the the management decisions, or or, or those to to the table, and also have them share with them, be part of that. So it's not just the Forest Service who's there and doing whatever they want. And I mean, because if you go to Puerto Rico, it's it's very telling. You you see all of the. The, the going through you go from in, in the airport you go to, to, towards El Junque you see most of the of the signs on the roads in Spanish except the ones that say this way to El Junque National Forest so it kind of shows you like this is colonialism we're here so it is a, a very it's a challenging situation there because it's a federal government uh, uh, owning this which is the the the, the treasure the 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 most precious treasure that, that Puerto Ricans have in terms of natural resources. So, so yeah, bringing those and, and bringing those that the, down those barriers are very, it's, it's, it, it was very helpful. And, and, and again, by, even if it's cliche, by hugging trees, by being in contact with nature that helps. So that's something that we can do. And, I, and, and we're right now helping um, in, 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 in the Chesapeake Bay area. We also been part of conversations in the, um, in the Northwest to create these opportunities where Latinos, communities of color, communities that ha have been excluded or have not been engaged in public management lands, how can we bring them in? How can we make them feel? And some of the, the elements that we bring always is tell them the notion of public lands, that public lands is some are lands that belong to all of those, that we all have the right to enjoy them, but we also have the responsibility to care for them. Yeah, you know, on, on uh, inauguration day, I was driving to one of our preserves and I was crossing over the Susquehanna River and, and the Woody Guthrie song, and this land is your land, this my, land is my land, came on right about at noon on NPR. And that was pretty significantly emotional, um, you know, leading to what you just said, that, you know, public lands are public lands, right? Regardless of the community that you come from, regardless of race, religion, whatever. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. I've got time for one more question, but we've got two that are related. So, uh, and they're excellent. Um, my question is, in your experience, is there a best way to engage with Latino families recreating on public lands in terms of environmental education, for example, signage or interactive events? And then related to that, um, oh, there it is. Um, where'd it go? Is there specific things that you could suggest that Lancaster Conservancy can do to welcome Latinx communities? Well, I think the, the solu one solution is reach out to the community, listen to the community, bring organizations that are already there, already in your, in, 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 as part of, of the communities that you're serving. It might be immigrants serving, it might be health, uh, health related. They already know, they have the trust and they have the, the, the ear of the community. So working with them, bringing them to the table and offering a, hey, we wanna create, for example, in a health or for an immigrant, Group, we want to create a program where we do a picnic with with your with your constituents, and you bring the expertise in conservation education, in in conservancy, in recreation. They bring the expertise on how to to engage with the community, and 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 again, don't don't expect that a flyer or or because you do an event on Cinco de Mayo, which I actually will encourage you to do it. Uh, will oh, Cinco de Mayo is a good day that that's just enough or just because we have signage. No, just be, it is an investment and diversity and inclusion doesn't come because of a memo from the, from the board of directors or because we just put out a couple of, of flyers in Spanish. No, it really, it's a, it's a, it's a painful, uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's painful because you have to, 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 to face a lot of realities and, 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 and unpack your own biases. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's it's it, it's very meaningful, and one of, and and challenge your own your own perception of how how people should should interact with nature. And and Keith has a lot of, Keith and I went through a lot of this with with other partners that were really like, no, no, this this is how it should be done. No, no, let's not bring food. Like, no, 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 let's charge them money. And and that's not how it is. So I will do is. Uh, talk to, to to those organizations. There's organizations that are already doing the work in the conservation. There's obviously us, Latino outdoors, and I'm sure there's got to be some 
um, that are there and, and just, just have those conversations, welcome them, figure out what can we do. And because you, you, you bring something that it's part of their portfolio of bringing well being to the community. So it might be with doctors, doctor with Parker, Parker X America. It could be with walk, uh, it could be with immigrant serving communities, maybe a, a forest therapy. It can be with youth. I mean, there's, there's several ways. Just, just fee, find those partnerships that will ask, that will provide. And of course, Corazon Latino, um, Keith knows, and for the Lancaster specifically, we're going to get, we're going to do some fun stuff. But for others, <laughs> figure out who those are. And, and again, you can get my email and I can give you some recommendations of specific in your area. Yes, so uh, thank you so much, Felipe. We do have a couple of, uh, of, of requests for your contact info in the chat. And uh, unfortunately, we're, we're out of time. Um, but uh, thanks again for, for all your time and commitment to this work. This is such a, an important uh, aspect of, of conservation work that I think is, is often forgotten. Uh, please don't forget the upcoming uh, uh, nature hours that we've, uh, we've gone over at the beginning of this this session, February 10th, Regenerative Agriculture and Planetary Health with the Rodale Institute. And on February 24th, Oysters in a Clear Bay with the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. We would love to see you all there. Felipe, again, thank you so much. I know you're incredibly busy right now with everything that's going on with climate policy, which I'm very proud of to know you in, in that work and happy for you that you're doing that work. And uh, we'll catch up again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for coming, everybody.